Gordon back with another small cap video. Joining us is the CEO of Bell Copper Corporation, Dr. Tim Marsh, former chief geologist at Resolution Copper, a recognized authority on copper. Porphyry Exploration, Dr. Tim, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Tim, let's start out with a little background on Bell Copper and then we'll get into the questions. Well, Bell Copper is a uh, Canadian junior exploration company. Uh, we have two projects both in the United States and the, in the great jurisdiction of Arizona. We're, we're listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol BCU, uh, listed in the U.S. on the OTCQB Exchange under the symbol BCUFF. We've got about 125 million shares outstanding, and we're trading around 14 cents this morning. And let's talk about this uh, region that you're focused in on uh, in Arizona, the state of Arizona. Uh, Arizona is number one for copper. Can you tell us a little bit about that region and updates on what you're doing there? Sure. Arizona is a, uh, a highly prolific copper producing region, very stable jurisdiction. 10% of every pound of copper in existence in the world today was extracted from the rocks in the state of Arizona been producing copper in a, a very significant way for the past 120 years. Got some of the biggest mines in the world producing copper every day, and those mines are uh, mining themselves out of existence. That creates the need for companies like Bell Copper to go out and find the, the next generation of copper mines that are going to let our children and grandchildren have copper into the future. And, and can you tell us a bit about your theories uh, regarding Big Sandy and Perseverance, please? Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty easy, really. It's the same theory that, that uh, relates to both of them. There's a fault, a place where the earth has, has shifted. It's shifted dramatically. It happened about 20 million years ago. And, and when it shifted, it broke uh, several large deposits into, into two pieces. There's a piece that's exposed on these two different projects that's uh, uh, deeper than where the copper forms in these, in these systems. And uh, that, that's really what Bell recognized is what other geologists has, had regarded as, as failed deposits. Bell recognized as the deep parts of potentially productive copper deposits. And uh, the, the shifted off piece, the faulted off piece is buried under gravel out in the valley bottoms. You know, uh, Arizona, a lot of Arizona and, and the state of Nevada, that region of the U.S. is, is broken up into basins and ranges. It's called the Basin and Range Province. Uh, but in order to make the basins and the ranges, very significant lateral movements had to happen. And what Bell has found by drilling, it's, it's, it's not a theory uh, any longer to the extent we've got the answer in our core boxes, the amount of movement required to produce the, the valley that we're drilling in is on the order of 13 kilometers. And I wouldn't have believed that if you had asked me the same question uh, 10 years ago, but we've drilled a lot of holes since then and have found that uh, the puzzle pieces don't go back together until you start sliding them uh, on the order of 13 kilometers. And have you had any uh, calls from larger companies? Yeah, they know me well. You know, I used to work at Rio Tinto, so, and Rio Tinto had a joint venture on our Perseverance project uh, back 2016 through 2018. So the Rio Tinto people uh, know me. They called when, when we uh, announced our intercept in, in BS3 at our big Sandy project. Uh, the BHP people called, talked with the Freeport people uh, back in September when I presented the uh, talk on the discovery at the Society of Mining Engineers meeting in Phoenix. So those, those three companies uh, have certainly communicated their their interest to Bell. You know, we're, we're not at the point where we want to do anything with anybody other than find out how large the, the discovery is that we've made. That's that's where we're at. We're, we're fleshing out the discovery. Small Cap Videos uh, talking with the CEO of Bell Copper Corporation, Dr. Tim Marsh. Uh, more information, bellcopper.net. Uh, Tim, tell us more about your MT survey. That's about three years old. Uh, it's a uh, you know, electrical geophysical survey that looks for conductors, electrical conductors, and and what we found when uh, when Doyne Deal decided that 
that would be a good approach for uh, exploring this system. Uh, we found a conductor of the size and shape of the target we were searching for right in the middle of our claim block. Uh, you know, we fleshed out our claim block to make sure we, we had the thing uh, after uh, the survey. The survey doesn't, doesn't cover, uh, you know, we don't have the entire electrical anomaly defined by the survey. We've got to do more of that kind of work uh, sometime in the future for the time being. We're drilling underneath that anomaly, finding the kinds of things we went looking for. And uh, what is the significance of your company's recent metallurgy testing? Well, as soon as we saw copper coming out of the ground in our BS3 hole in amounts that are potentially uh, economically significant, we wanted to show the market that not not only is it in the rock, but it's also recoverable using conventional recovery techniques. So we took a 200 meter intersection from BS3, sent it to the Lakefield lab up there in uh, Ontario, and and they uh, tested it using conventional froth flotation. They produced a 25% copper con, which is a, a concentrate grade that any smelter would be happy to be dumping into their smelter today, uh, making uh, making copper. Uh, the grade of, of the interval that we sent up to them, uh, the overall copper grade was 0.42% copper. And there isn't, a, there isn't a mine in the state of Arizona working today that is, that is delivering 0.42% copper to their mill. They're all in the 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3% range. So uh, even though it's, it's currently undefined in size, uh, our first whack into it is a grade that is significant in the state of Arizona. Doesn't doesn't mean it's going to be profitably extractable. It's it's down uh, under under a lot of gravel. There's there's lots of engineering kinds of things that have to be done to to determine that that uh, somebody could make money getting that out. But metallurgically, using froth flotation, it produces this 25% uh, copper con. That con's got uh, 138 grams per ton of silver along with it. Another thing we asked the lab to do was make a molly con. So we didn't just hit copper, we got some silver along with it. Uh, we also got some molybdenite, not very much. We're not in the right part of the system to, uh, to produce uh, high grade molly, but we did see some molly. And one of the questions we asked was uh, how much of the strategic metal rhenium is in that molybdenum? What we saw in our, our very first hole that we drilled at Big Sandy, BS1, that's about a half, uh, better part of a mile away, 1.2 kilometers away. In our first hole, we cut molybdenite. And uh, one of the questions I needed answered was how old is that molybdenite? We sent it to a lab in, in Colorado, Colorado State University lab. They called back pretty quickly after I sent them the sample, said, Tim, you, you kind of broke our mass spectrometer. This has got so much rhenium in it that we couldn't analyze it. We had to dilute the sample down and, and reanalyze it. But it carried about 1% by weight rhenium in the molybdenite concentrate that I sent them. And globally, that's, that's an extraordinary amount of rhenium. Rhenium is used to make the, the fan blades on turbines to prevent jet engines from melting, to prevent the, uh, the gas turbine electrical generators that make a lot of people's electricity, keep those blades from melting at very high temperature. So rhenium is a, a critical strategic element for uh, you know, modern technology, these big, uh, big turbines. It's also a, a catalyst for cleaning up air, environmental things like that. Uh, but it's, it's a, a very important element. It is present in our uh, molybdenite at Big Sandy in spades. Uh, we, we moved 1.2 kilometers from that initial intersection and drilled our big, our big Sandy BS3 hole. And uh, one of the things the Lakefield lab in Ontario did was to uh, analyze the rhenium in our molybdenite. And they said, if we can make a commercially standard 50% rhenium concentrate, that would have about a 0.18% or 1800 parts per million uh, rhenium content, which again, globally, that's a, that's a very high uh, rhenium concentrate. So it says our first result wasn't just a, a spot fluke, wasn't, wasn't a, you know, a one hole wonder, whatever Big Sandy turns out to be, it's looking pretty good that rhenium is going to be a, a significant uh, contributor to whatever value Big Sandy has. We'll have, we'll have copper, we'll have silver, uh, molybdenum, and a, uh, and a rhenium credit.
another aspect of the metallurgy that I didn't cover was uh, we also asked Lakefield Labs to determine if this copper that we found in our big sandy hole BS3 uh, might be recoverable by an in situ leach process rather than tunneling down four th up 4,000 feet and dragging all the rocks back to surface. Uh, maybe we could just drill a hole down there, uh, inject a, a suitable solvent and recover the uh, the copper through a, through a drill hole. It's being done in Arizona today down at uh, Florence. Uh, so we, we asked Lakefield to test the rocks, see if we could get our copper uh, using that approach. And, and the result was we 96% of the copper in the rock is recoverable by a, a leaching process. Doesn't say, uh, you know, it'll work when you scale it up, but uh, we know that the rock doesn't consume the solvent. You, know, you don't destroy your solvent by pumping it down into the earth. It, uh, it dissolves the copper and uh, is returned so that you can send it back down for another load. Uh, and 96% and of the copper that, that is in that intersection uh, was recoverable by, by this leaching method. Again, it's, it's not a, it's not a uh, in situ leach feasibility result, but it is a first good indication that uh, we need to keep our eyes open and, and think about the possibility that in situ leaching is the right approach for extracting at least the early years of copper out of Big Sandy. Uh, Tim, before we get to your presentation, the last question, can you elaborate on the supply demand fundamentals of copper? I, I mentioned that in reference to a, a Financial Post article by billionaire miner uh, Robert Friedland warning of a copper train wreck. Can you give us your thoughts before the presentation on that? Yeah, he's, he's spot on. Train wreck is exactly how I would describe it. Uh, I saw the, saw the title of that article and I thought, you know, thank God somebody with a, with a, uh, an audience as big as Robert Friedland is, uh, getting, getting the word out that, that there's a dramatic mismatch between the amount of copper that the world is producing today and what it's going to need to produce if we're really going to throw away uh, internal combustion engines and switch everybody over to electrical powered cars. Uh, the electrical grid isn't what it needs to be. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got these new things, electric cars that require three or four times the amount of copper that a, a conventional car requires. So we're going to take every car out there as long as everybody still gets the, the privilege of driving. We're going to give them a car that's got you know, four times as much copper as, as what they used to drive around. The, the world the world can't do it. Glen, Glencore did a study. They say uh, in the next seven years, we've got to have another 50 million tons of refined copper coming out of the ground. And the current mines can't do it. The production out of current mines is, is falling every day. Uh, there, there are a lot of bad things happening in the world to uh, clip the wings of current copper production, nationalism, resource nationalism, uh, a lot of trouble uh, with weather around the big mines down in, in uh, Chile. Uh, just as we're speaking, it's, it's winter down there and they're getting some, some big flood events that are taking out some of the biggest uh, copper producers in the world. So there are hits to existing mines, but really what hasn't happened is uh, massive investment in exploration for new deposits. New deposits are, are going to be required uh, to make this transition. I don't think it's possible. But Bell has really focused on finding the kinds of deposits that the world will need if we're gonna make this, this transition. Bell can't do it all by ourselves, but we've got two in our stable. The only two projects we've got, they're both uh, globally significant copper exploration projects. And we think we got it in the core box at Big Sandy. We're very close to getting to that point at Perseverance. So uh, that's under option to one of Robert Friedland's companies. Uh, the court of a people saw what Bell was doing at uh, Perseverance and said, hey, they're doing the right thing. We need to, we need to get involved. And so they've spent over $4 million earning a majority interest, 51% interest in that project. And just having spoken with them in the past uh, few days, they're really enthused about getting back out there and, and uh, finishing the discovery process at Perseverance. It, it was really uh, our encouragement from Perseverance, which got us out to Big Sandy three years ago. 
And with hole number one, we were seeing the right kinds of minerals to say that, yeah, the idea works. We've, we've got the product of the idea in the core box at, uh, at Big Sandy. And we've got a lot of strong indications that the same thing is uh, in the works at Perseverance. So a, a little company with a, you know, an $18 million market cap uh, is, is providing the food chain that, that the world's giant miners are going to need if they're going to stay in the mining business in the future. They need new deposits. Their exploration groups are, are trying hard, but they're not delivering the goods to keep their own companies afloat. And those, those giant companies are going to need to consume companies like Bell Copper uh, to stay in the mining business and to try and make this new copper that the world says it it demands. Uh, Tim, thank you for the time. appreciate your insight on this. We're talking with Dr. Tim Marsh, uh, CEO of Bell Copper. Tim, I'm going to step off the stage, so to speak, hand things over to you, and I'll be back at the end of this edition of Small Cap Videos Good. to wrap things up. Thanks, sir. Stage is yours. All right. I'm going to give an overview on Bell Copper Corporation. We're a Canadian public exploration company listed on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol BCU. We're also listed uh, on the U.S. OTCQB Exchange under the symbol BCUFF. We've got about 125 million shares outstanding. Uh, market cap today is around $18 million. But Bell's got uh, Oh, more than a thousand shareholders. About a quarter of those are insiders. That's uh, management. And uh, in particular, our, our second largest shareholder, Godby Drilling Company, uh, earned their, their ownership by seeing what was coming out of the ground at uh, Perseverance. Uh, they said uh, we would be happy to, uh, to take our payment for this hole in the form of, of Bell stock. And uh, at the time, Bell was trading for three cents a share. And uh, because of uh, exchange regulations, uh, we couldn't sell it for less than a nickel a share. So Godby got their, their uh, significant ownership, about 14% of the company, by, by seeing what was coming out of the ground, taking stock at a nickel for share when we were trading on the market at three cents a share. But uh, they've been in the, the drilling business and geology business for uh, three generations. And they, they knew that what was coming out of the ground was, uh, was significant and they wanted to get involved. And, and uh, we've retained uh, the president of Godby Drilling Company, John Godby, as a director on the board. And uh, they're currently up on Big Sandy, uh, giving it hell every day in the heat of the Arizona summer. Uh, pushing BS4 down and uh, showing us what our, our next project, uh, the Big Sandy project, uh, has in store for us. Another very significant shareholder, uh, institutional, our only institutional uh, shareholder is Crestcat Capital out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, Crestcat has been very supportive uh, in our uh, earlier financing for Big Sandy and uh, uh, they're a very, very strong supporter of, of what we're doing uh, with our drilling at Big Big Sandy BS4, advancing the project there. So they, they hold uh, just under uh, 20%. I think they're around 16 or 17% of the company. Uh, the, then the rest are uh, retail investors. And we, we've got people that have been with us because they understand the, this fault model. It's, it's a it's a pretty uh, low risk sort of model. You can see the bottom of these deposits that we're chasing. They're giant. We know they're globally significant because they're, they're kilometers across down in the, uh, the unproductive bottom part. And what gives us confidence that uh, there is a productive upper part is our, our intersections, uh, both at Perseverance and, and Big Sandy. And really Big Sandy is the first one to show uh, economically significant uh, intersections BS3, the 200 meters of 0.42% copper. Bell has two projects in Mojave County. One is uh, currently under option. The Perseverance project is under option to uh, Cordoba Minerals. Cordoba Minerals is owned a majority by uh, Robert Friedland. Uh, Cordoba has done enough work on the Perseverance project since they, they joined us in 2018 to earn a 51% interest in that project. To this day, Cordoba is enthused about the prospects of finding a globally significant copper deposit at Perseverance, and uh, they intend to do a lot more work there in the future.
in the meanwhile, while uh, Perseverance is, is being uh, explored by Cordoba, by, uh, funded by Cordoba, the success of that fault model at Perseverance really led us to Big Sandy and, and our first drill hole at Big Sandy demonstrated that the, the fault model works. Uh, our third drill hole there uh, cut an economic intersection, 200 meters of 0.42% copper and a bit over two grams per ton silver with clear evidence of, of molybdenum and, and rhenium mineralization. So uh, we've got a drill turning today uh, on hole BS4 at Big Sandy. Uh, that hole is uh, two thirds of the way down through the, the gravel cover uh, with the objective of, of demonstrating a very significant offset to our BS3 hole that we cut last year. That, that BS3 intersection drove our stock price uh, temporarily up to uh, about 72 cents Canadian. Uh, we've settled back down to uh, current price around 14 cents. So uh, it's, it's pretty clear the the potential that the market sees when uh, a new significant copper discovery is made. Uh, with our BS4 hole, we'll be offsetting the, the BS3 intersection about 500 meters down at the, the depth of the copper. The, the drill site is 900 meters away from BS3. And uh, again, we're, we're drilling through uh, sand and gravel and boulders and all kinds of things in between, working our way down to the bedrock that has, uh, we hope, the, the copper in it. We also hope to be in a, a much more copper rich environment within the deposit at Big Sandy once we get down to that bedrock. And the next few weeks, uh, maybe a month or two of drilling, will we'll, uh, tell the story on whether we've really got a, a globally significant copper deposit there. Uh, just for scale, I've dummied in the outline of the current Bingham Canyon pit. That's the, the largest hole on Earth said to be visible from the surface of the moon. It's the largest hole that man has ever made. It, it took 120 years to dig that, that hole out. But you can see in terms of the thing we're looking for, it is, it is every bit as big, uh, you know, dimension-wise as uh, the Bingham Canyon pit. And it, uh, you know, it starts down below the bottom of the Bingham Canyon pit. So we're embarked on a very significant exploration program probing deep parts of the earth, parts where mining of copper has been done in the past, uh, feasibly, economically, profitably. So we're not, we're not pushing the envelope of what's possible. Uh, 30 years ago, I stood down at the level of where that super gene enrichment blanket is labeled. Uh, watching a miner poke and prod at uh, you know thousand pound rocks and drop them into a rail car to four thousand feet below surface, the grade of the material that that miner was working on forty years ago, thirty years ago, was 0.6 percent copper at a time when the price of copper was sixty cents per pound. So four thousand feet down, sixty cent a pound copper, 0.6 percent copper grade was being mined 30 years ago. You can imagine, you know, at today's price of copper, uh, copper can be mined at the sorts of depths Bell is exploring. It will have to be mined at the depths Bell is exploring if the world is gonna get the, uh, the sort of copper that it needs to transition to electrical energy. Bell is chasing giant porphyry systems. We know they're giant because we can measure their bottoms. I think you can tell a lot by, uh, by looking at a bottom, see if you really want to get to know the top. Big Sandy is uh, six by five kilometers down at the bottom. One dimension that we measure is the, the size of the pyrite shell. When these things form, they, they blow pyrite out around the margin and form a shell of heavy pyrite mineralization. We can measure that with a tape measure on the surface at Big Sandy because it's exposed. It was exposed by faulting. And uh, that dimension, six by five kilometers, compares very well with the biggest copper deposits in the world, Escondida, Chuquicamata, uh, Los Bronces, Cananea, Coyahuasi. Uh, those are all giant deposits. They have big pyrite shells around them, and they have billions of tons of copper ore associated with them. We don't have resources at Big Sandy or Perseverance yet, but based on their the size of their pyrite shell, we have a strong indication that we should spend a lot of time looking for the tops of these systems 
just based on the size of their pyrite shells. The pyrite shell at Perseverance is five kilometers by three kilometers. And any of the biggest copper deposits in the world would would rattle around nicely inside those pyrite shells. I describe it as a, a marble rolling around in a tin can. Uh, there's, there's lots of room within these giant pyrite shells for globally significant copper deposits. So we, we know we're looking for something big we have uh, we make very large step outs with our drilling kilometer scale step outs 500 meter scale step outs uh, because we're looking for big things if we find it in one hole uh, to get to the other side of the deposit we need to be moving uh, many many hundreds of meters uh, 200 meter step outs will never show us the scale of what we found in the time time that's that's reasonable to uh, define a, a mineral resource so we make very large step outs all right that concludes my presentation back to you jim uh jim gordon back uh with uh, this edition of small cap interviews uh, dr tim we appreciate you joining us ceo of bell copper corporation uh dr tim give our uh, viewers the ticker information one more time Sure, Bell Copper is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol BCU, and we're in the US on the OTCQB Exchange under the symbol BCUFF. Uh, you can also find out more information at bellcopper.net. You can find out more information on us on the uh, Small Cap Interviews uh, YouTube channel. Don't forget to also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm Jim Gordon, and thank you for joining us on this edition of Small Cap Interviews.